Have you ever tried to execute and debug a suspicious executable only to find that it produces no activity and immediately terminates in a debugger? Maybe you've also noticed these Windows APIs in the import address table. In this video, I'll discuss what those imports mean and also describe a simple modification you can make to the file in order to more effectively analyze this type of malware. My name is Anuj Sony, and my goal with this YouTube channel is to share strategies and discuss resources that I hope will help you better understand malicious code. So let's get started. I'm gonna jump into a Windows 10 VM that I use for malware analysis. It's actually very similar to the VMs uh, that we use in the SANS malware analysis courses that I author and teach. Within VMware Fusion, I have this configured in host only mode, which means it does not have access to the internet. So bottom line, make sure that you are doing all of your analysis uh, within a virtual machine so that you reduce the chance of infecting your host and the network. The focus of this discussion is going to be an executable here that I have on the desktop called 12a6.exe. And as I say that out loud, making a mental note to maybe think of an easier file name next time. In the link in the description to this video, I will have a reference uh, to the password protected zip file that you can use to download and uh, hopefully try this on your own as well. One common step as part of the initial malware analysis process is to perform behavioral analysis in order to understand what happens on the system when the executable is actually launched. I could launch a process hacker here from my desktop and I'm gonna place that over on the right hand side. Next, I'm simply going to execute this uh, program from the desktop. Now, believe it or not, I did just double click it and no matter how hard I click and how many times I click, uh, unfortunately, I will not see any activity. If I were to continue my reverse engineering as part of that process, I might toss this 32-bit executable into uh, X32 debug, which is the 32-bit version of the X64 debug tool. And if I go ahead and just run this program by clicking on the arrow here on the top left, I'll notice that unfortunately it immediately terminates. So all this likely indicates that uh, something is wrong perhaps with my execution process here, right? The approach I'm using to actually launch this program uh, may not be sufficient. Now, it may also be that there is some sort of anti-debug or anti-VM capability built in here. But let me show you another perspective on this program that might help us better understand what's happening. I'm gonna go ahead and close X32 debug here for the moment and drag and drop my file into PE Studio, which is a valuable static file analysis tool for analyzing Windows executable. I'm gonna hop over here to the functions part of the output, which essentially shows me the input address table, right? Which is the list of functions that this program depends upon and the corresponding DLLs where these functions actually reside. Now, one group of functions you might notice here seems to be associated with services. And in fact, that is what the group column here, that third column from the left, indicates. We see a reference to register service control handler A, set service status, and start service control dispatcher A. These are Windows APIs used to create and manage Windows services, indicating that this executable is likely supposed to be executed as a service. This would explain why simply double clicking or executing it in a debugger doesn't work. Now, one approach to analyzing this sort of program includes manually creating a service within Windows and then using a debugger to actually attach to that running service. However, I feel like that can get a bit tedious and time consuming. So I'm gonna show you an alternative approach that has worked for me. First, we need to understand that every service executable has a function named service main, and that serves as the entry point into that service. Service main is really responsible for two things. First, it initializes the service so that it can actually be run. And second, and most importantly, it actually accomplishes the task that the service intends to perform. But how do we find service main? Well, this Microsoft documentation indicates that service main calls reg service control handler or one of its variants. So if we can find a reference to register service control handler in the program, that means we have found service main and we can see what happens next after the service is actually initialized. Now, in order to find the reference to register service control handler, we're gonna load this program into Ghidra. So I'm gonna quickly close down these other programs. Now, I should mention if you haven't used Ghidra before, I encourage you to check out my previous video on this YouTube channel, which is actually the only previous video on this channel, which I created three years ago. So set a pretty low bar for consistency on this channel so far. So to launch Ghidra, I'm gonna go ahead and double click on the associated icon here on my desktop. And with this project window loaded here, I'll go ahead and go to File, New Project. I will choose Non-Shared Project because we're not working in any sort of collaborative environment right now. I'll hit Next. I'll then give my project a name. Let's call this a Service EXE Example. 
and hit finish. Next, I'll drag and drop my suspect file here into that project window and allow it to perform its import. I'll then press OK. Once the summary appears, click through that and then double click on my imported file. All right, maybe I'm enjoying the editing process a little too much here. I'll do better. Next, when the analyze dialog appears, I will click yes to go ahead and do some processing of this file. And because this is a 32-bit program, if I scroll down here, I will want to go ahead and choose and select the Windows PE x86 propagate external parameters, which essentially populates in Ghidra's comments some more information about arguments that are being passed to APIs. So let me go ahead and check this box and hit analyze. Now this is still processing here in the background, but in the meantime, I'm gonna close some windows that we're not gonna take advantage of right now, like the decompiler output and this uh, console window as well. Looks like we are done processing just based on looking at the bottom right. I'm not seeing any more progress bars. As a reminder, our goal right now is to find the service main function, which is an entry point into the service. We're gonna do so by identifying a function call to register service control handler, which is that function that we briefly discussed earlier. Within Ghidra, in order to find references to APIs, we're gonna to go to window, symbol references. Within the symbol references table here, I'm gonna go down to the filter field and search for service control. There we go. Register service control handler is what I'm after. And I see that it's got two references here on the right-hand side. One under the access column is data and the other one is a call. Well, I'm looking for an actual function call to this API. So I'm gonna click on this first row and even more specifically on the from location, right? So this value right here. In the background, if I just minimize this, it actually takes me to that location where I can see a call to that API. Now you'll notice part of it's cut off. If you wanna quickly just modify the column sizes here based on your screen real estate, you can click on the top right here on this button where when you mouse over it, it says edit the listing fields. And I'm just gonna go ahead and allow for a bit more visibility there in that column. There we go. And although we arrived here based on the call to register service control handler, the call of interest is actually not this one, but the function call that follows immediately thereafter. You'll notice that there is a call right here to a function located at address 401A3A. And this is typically where there's going to be something of substance that we as a malware analyst might wanna dig deeper into. In fact, if I go ahead and double click on here, that takes me to the actual location of this function in memory. And if I wanna get a brief overview of the function calls that are made from within this function, I can take advantage of the function call tree within Ghidra. In order to access that, I go to window here at the top again, and then find function call trees. At the bottom, this brings up on the left and right hand side, incoming calls and outgoing calls. And right now I'm interested in outgoing calls. In other words, function calls that are called from this particular function where I currently reside. And what you'll see on the bottom right are some function calls. Notice, for example, at the very bottom, there is a reference to create thread, which is certainly interesting from a malware analysis perspective. And if I go ahead and do a control A to highlight all of these outgoing calls, and then right click and choose expand nodes to depth limit, I actually see additional APIs of interest. For example, I see a reference to create file and read file. I also see a reference to create process A. So whenever malware decides to actually launch a process that is of interest. If I want to go ahead and expand this function right here, it contains references to APIs like virtualloc X, write process memory, and virtual protect X, which are also typically of interest in the context of malware analysis. So the bottom line is that this function does in fact appear to do some interesting things. And this is an indication that this is where the malicious code for this service executable might reside. So I've now found the function that I believe performs the core component of what I believe is a malicious executable to actually analyze this program, both from a behavioral perspective and from a debugging perspective, I'm gonna suggest that we actually tweak the header of this Windows executable in order to make it easier for us to reverse engineer. My ultimate goal here is gonna to be to modify this executable such that when I double click on it or toss it into a debugger, it immediately begins executing from this function of interest located at this address 401A3A. Now, in order to tweak the executable in the way that I want to, what I need to grab is simply the relative offset of this function, right? its relative address, which is basically these last two bytes, 1A, 3A. I'm gonna hit Control-C on my keyboard. 
I'm gonna go ahead and take advantage of another tool here that I have on the desktop called CFF Explorer, which is gonna allow me to make the change that I need within this program. I'm gonna drag and drop 12a6.exe into CFF Explorer. And then I'm gonna to browse to the optional header here on the left-hand side. And that is where I see a field called address of entry point, which specifies the relative offset, right? The relative address of where the entry point is uh, for this program relative to wherever it's located in memory. So I'm going to go ahead to this field and simply replace these last two bytes and hit control V on my keyboard to add the 1A, 3A there instead. Hit enter. And now I'm gonna save this program. Uh, let's use a different file name here so that we can be clear about which one is modified. And I'm gonna add the underscore mod to this file name, place that on the desktop and there it is right here. Now, if my change to this file was successful, first, when I double click on it, it should actually run. And second, I should see some activity. Remember, we saw interesting APIs like references to create process, which would indicate that it's actually launching a child process. And if we see that sort of activity when launching it, well, maybe that means we have achieved success here, at least in terms of actually executing a service executable in an easier fashion. Let me go ahead and bring up Process Hacker as I did before and pop that over here to the right-hand side. And now I'm gonna double click the modified version of the executable, paying close attention to the output in Process Hacker to see if there is any activity of interest. We see the process pop up and most importantly, it seems to have launched rundll32.exe, which is why we see that running there as well. If I perform a similar test as I did at the beginning of this video and now try to load it in a debugger, let me go ahead and drag and drop this into x32 debug. I might try to set a breakpoint on one of those interesting APIs that we saw within Ghidra, right? That certainly is a common reverse engineering workflow. So let me go ahead and set a breakpoint using the BP command here at the bottom and specify uh, create process A, which is one of those APIs that we saw in the function call tree within Ghidra. I'll hit enter to actually set that breakpoint and then run this program. And after a moment, you'll notice I have now actually paused at create process. And if I take a look on the right hand side where you get more information about what's happening in memory, we can see that uh, run dll32.exe is in fact being launched by the modified version of our service exe. Now there's clearly more to analyze with this sample, but I'm going to leave the rest of that work to you for now. So this video discussed how to modify the header of a Windows executable in order to more easily perform behavioral and debugging analysis. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see the next one, definitely subscribe. I promise you won't have to wait more than three years. Also, if you have other questions or topics that you'd like to see me cover related to malware analysis, please leave a comment. And finally, if you want to learn more about the SANS malware analysis courses that I author and teach, check out the links in the description, and I'll see you next time.